Uh, so my name is Eric Press. I'm an Equal Opportunity Specialist with the San Francisco Regional Office of the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights. Uh, I have been with the department since 2008. Um, today we are going to be talking about uh, some principles of language access, um, some lang the language access regulations that are enforced by OCR, uh, uh, the enforcement examples, and then we are going to finish up uh, with a review of the HIPAA privacy rule and uh, its interplay with uh, language access regulations. So starting with the background of our agency. Um, so the, as the regional, as the civil rights law enforcement agency for the US Department of Health and Human Services, the Office for Civil Rights or OCR, as I'm going to refer to it throughout the presentation, uh, ensures compliance with our nation's civil rights, conscious and religious freedom and health information and secure, privacy and security laws by investigating compli complaints, conducting compliance reviews, requiring remedial action from covered entities, promulgating prom policies and regulations, and providing technical assistance and public education for the American people. The mission of OCR is to improve the health and well-being of people across the nation to ensure that people have access, uh, equal access to HHS programs without facing unlawful discrimination and to protect the privacy and security of health information in accordance with applicable law. OCR's activities are coordinated by a central office uh, located in Washington, DC, which promulgates uh, policy regulations and generally provides oversight uh, of OCR's enforcement activity. Uh, OCR also includes eight regional offices, which are responsible for investigating complaints, conducting compliance reviews, providing technical assistance to covered entities, and engaging in community outreach to educate the public about their rights. OCR's regional offices allow it to have a physical presence across the U.S. and ensures the department maintains close contact with state, local, and tribal partners and addresses the needs of communities and individuals served in their respective areas. Uh, I am from the Pacific region, which as you can see here is a pretty large jurisdiction. Um, it covers Nevada, Arizona, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and some, uh, some island territories. Uh, so OCRs enforces several federal uh, civil rights laws which prohibit discrimination in the delivery of health and human services. Uh, we uh, enforce regulations that discrimin uh, discrim uh, prohi prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, disability, uh, and religion. In addition, on the, uh, on the left here, uh, OCR also enforces a series of regulations that were promulgated by the department as part of the Health in in uh, Information, Privacy, and Portability Act, and later the High Tech Act. So these are really our two big areas of authority, our uh, kind of proper civil rights, uh, what you would think of as civil rights authorities, and then HIPAA, health information, privacy, and security. So uh, as, the fact as a fact-finding agency, OCR receives investigates and resolves thousands of complaints a year from the public alleging discrimination in health and human services. In general, our casework is driven by complaints from the public. Uh, complaints may be filed by any person who feels their rights or the rights of a third party may have been violated. OCR also has authority to proactively initiate a review of any recipient's uh, practices for compliance with our authorities. Uh, Finally, OCR may leverage uh, an individual complaint of discrimination into a compliance review uh, in order to achieve broad corrective action on a county or statewide level. OCR is generally able to help recipients take voluntary corrective actions to ensure their programs operate in or come into compliance with Title VI. Uh, 
and Section 1557. Um, in fact, OCR is required to resolve uh, any a matter informally when possible. Uh, however, when the law is violated and a recipient refuses to come into compliance, OCR can and will either initiate proceedings to terminate federal financial assistance or alternatively refer the case to the Department of Justice for enforcement. While either of these courses of action is done infrequently, OCR will certainly not hesitate to proceed with enforcement actions when necessary. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the language access regulations. Um, I, I mentioned them uh, a little bit before. Uh, Title VI and Section 1557 are OCR's two main authorities uh, when it comes to language access. Uh, Title VI states that no person in the uh, United States on the grounds of race, color, uh, or national origin shall be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title VI and its implementing regulation prohibit recipients of federal financial assistance from discriminating against persons because of their race, color, national or national origin, and requires recipients to take reasonable steps to provide meaningful access to recipients' programs and activities. Under Title VI, the term national origin includes, but is not limited to, an individual's or his ancestors' place of origin, such as a country, or physical, cultural, or linguistic characteristics of a national origin group. In 1974, in Lau v. Nichols, the Supreme, the Supreme Court held that Title VI prohibits conduct that has a disproportionate effect on limited English proficient individuals because such conduct constitutes national origin discrimination. In that case, a San Francisco school district that had a significant number of non-English speaking students of Chinese origin was required to take reasonable steps to provide them with a meaningful opportunity to participate in federally funded educational programs. Uh, down the line, uh, uh, Section 1557, OCR's other language access authority, uh, is the non-discrimination provision of the Affordable Care Act which was passed in 2010. Uh, section 1557 expands on the existing federal, federal civil rights laws uh, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, and disability, and unifies them in a, into a single regulation. So who is covered? Um, so who is required to comply with the federal standards? Uh, the scope of the regulations are pretty wide. Um, all, health all, all health programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance, such as Medicaid, uh, are, would be covered by the regulations. The, the 1557 regulation applies to health programs and activities administered by health entities created under Title I of the Affordable Care Act, which includes state-based and federally facilitated health insurance marketplaces. So that's the area that 1557 extends to that uh, Title VI doesn't quite reach. But uh, you know, as we said before, a lot of their protections uh, overlap. Um, so here are some quick examples of covered entities under Title VI and 1557. Uh, we see state agencies, school, uh, medical schools, and other healthcare programs, welfare programs, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, adult day activity programs, public health clinics. So it's a, a pretty wide variety of entities uh, who must comply with these regulations. So OCR's language access. Uh, Language access regulations protect limited English proficient or LEP individuals. An LEP individual is a person whose primary language for communication is not English and who has a limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English. Under federal law, uh, a covered entity may not delay or deny effective language assistance services to LEP individuals or require an individual to disclose their citizenship or immigration status. 
A covered entity may not deny an individual a service or aid, a service aid or benefit uh, that is different based on race, color, national origin, or provide the benefit in a manner uh, which is different. Um, individual, uh, a entity may not subject an individual to segregation or separate treatment, uh, restrict an individual in the enjoyment of benefits or privileges. Uh, they may not treat an individual differently in determining eligibility or deny a person the opportunity to participate on a planning board. Um, so those are all um, some basic protections. Um, so in addition, recipients may not utilize methods of administration or select physical sites or locations for the provision of services that have the effect of excluding individuals of a particular race, color, or national origin. Um, I also wanted to note here that Title VI and Section 1557's protections are available to all individuals present in the United States, regardless of legal citizenship or residency, and that citizens and non-citizens alike have standing to submit complaints to OCR if they feel their rights under these regulations have been violated. So let's uh, just go through an example of uh, national origin discrimination and the two, the two types of national origin discrimination. Uh, so on top, uh, a, physician's, a physician at a hospital's emergency department denied an LEP mother, a Spanish interpreter, when she requested language assistance. Instead, the physician used the mother's 13-year-old son as the interpreter while he was being treated for a dog bite. Uh, the hospital also failed to translate or orally explain the discharge instructions in Spanish. Um, so that would be an example of national origin discrimination in a language access context. Uh, so the second uh, example is a social worker at a social services agency required a mother to disclose her immigration status when she applied for health services for her eligible child. So that is also an, an example of race, color, and national origin discrimination, uh, but that is uh, outside the, uh, the language access context. So those are just sort of the, an example of the two areas uh, that we look for when we're talking about Title VI and 1557. So let's uh, move on to principles of language access. So in the last section, we discussed uh, Lau versus Nichols, where the Supreme Court held that the failure of a recipient of federal funds to provide language assistance services to LEP individuals may constitute national origin discrimination. So what do the federal protections against national origin discrimination mean for LEP individuals? Uh, as a general rule, recipients of federal financial assistance must take reasonable steps to ensure meaningful access to their programs, activities, and services, regardless of race, color, or national origin. For LEP individuals, ensuring meaningful access requires that recipients of federal financial assistance be systematically prepared, uh, be systematically prepared to provide competent and timely language assistance services. Uh, so, uh, a covered entity must take reasonable steps. Um, so as uh, an example of reasonable steps, a covered entity is frequently expected to offer a qualified interpreter when oral interpretation is a reasonable step to provide uh, an individual with meaningful access. Um, and where uh, interpreters are uh, a necessary step or a reasonable step, uh, they should be provided free of charge. So in order to serve LEP individuals, recipients of federal financial assistance should develop a language access plan that addresses the needs of the LEP population present in its service area. Designing an effective language access plan begins with an assessment of the number or proportion of LEP persons eligible to be served or likely to be encountered by the recipient. Um, and I also wanted to take a moment here to say that the eligible served likely to be encountered 
is not uh, encounter data that we, when we ask for that assessment from entities, frequently we will have them provide uh, their that you know a you know proof that they have shown uh, a review of their encounter data in the hospital, um, the you, the patients that are actually being seen at the hospital, and that is not really that is sometimes part of an assessment of a service area. But that assessment of the service area should really include uh, the, uh, you know, entire service area the present, all of the individuals present in that area. Um, so re resorting to census or census and other data is frequently necessary. Um, so based on the assessment of the number and proportion of LEP individuals, uh, the recipient should determine the types of language assistance services that it will provide to LEP persons and draft policies and procedures on the provision of those services, including standards to ensure their competency and timeliness. After the policy has been developed, it should be implemented by the recipient, including training workforce members. After the recipient has implemented its language access plan, it should continue to reassess its service area periodically to determine if demographic changes in the community necessitate a change in the mix of language services it provides. Language assistance services include, but are not limited to, uh, bilingual staff, staff interpreters, contractors, um, uh, telephone lines and teleconferencing, community volunteers, written translation. So these are just uh, examples of uh, services that are provided by covered entities in order to provide uh, access to persons who are limited English proficient. Eric? Yes. Can you speak a little more slowly? Of course. Thank you. Uh, so recipients have flexibility in determining the appropriate mix of language assistance services to be provided in various circumstances, uh, but must ensure both the competency and timeliness of such services. Um, so, uh, Yeah, so those are really the two benchmarks of uh, whether or not uh, a service is effective is the competency and the timeliness. Um, so let's talk first about competency. Um, we'll start with competency uh, in establishing these standards. Uh, so let's look at the standards for competency. A covered entity must adhere to certain quality standards in delivering language assistance services for instance, a covered entity may not require an individual to provide his or her own interpreter, rely on a minor child to interpret, except in a life-threatening emergency where there is no qualified interpreter immediately available, uh, may not rely on interpreters that the individual prefers when, the, when, there are act, when there are competency, confidentiality, or other concerns, uh, may not rely on unqualified bilingual or multilingual staff or use low quality video remote interpretation services. Uh, so in establishing these standards, OCR noted that it is in recipients best interest to use sufficiently qualified language assistance services to avoid unnecessary errors and costs. Um, section 1557 provides standards for interpreter competence. Under section 1557, qualified interpreter for an individual with limited English proficiency uh, means an interpreter who via remote interpreting service or an on-site appearance adheres to generally accepted interpreter ethics principles, including client confidentiality, has demonstrated proficiency in speaking and understanding both English and at least one other spoken language, and is able to interpret is able to interpret effectively, accurately, and impartially, both receptively and expressively, to and from such languages and English, using any necessary specialized vocabulary, terminology, and phraseology. Um, 
So as you can see, that is a fairly uh, exacting uh, standard for qualified interpretation. And that really reflects, or, uh, you know, the state of the art of where the field of interpretation is now um, that we, uh, you know, hold uh, professional interpreters to a high standard in the services that they provide. Um, for qualified bilingual, multilingual staff, um, the 1557 also provides a definition for qualified uh, bilingual slash multilingual staff. Um, that is, uh, and this is members of the recipient's workforce whose main professional duties might be something other than language assistance, but who possess language skill, uh, but who possess the necessary language skills to provide language assistance. Uh, we see this commonly with bilingual or multilingual nurses who work in an emergency setting and may want to use their language skills to provide treatment where there may not be time to obtain a staff interpreter or for front office staff who may engage in simple basic communications directly in patients' primary languages. Um, so qualified bilingual multilingual staff means a member of a covered entity's workforce who is designated by the covered entity to provide oral language assistance as part of the individual's current assigned job responsibilities and who has demonstrated to the covered entity that he or she is proficient in speaking and understanding both English and at least one other spoken language, including any necessary specialized vocabulary, terminology, and phraseology, and is able to effectively, accurately, and impartially communicate directly with individuals with limited English proficiency in their primary languages. Uh, so here we see that, uh, you know, if we go back, it's a slightly less exacting standard than what we would uh, uh, require of a qualified interpreter. Uh, but uh, it is, uh, you know, but it allows people who do not, may, may not professionally, uh, you know, do this as their career to, uh, provide these services to patients. Um, so we should note that the phrase has demonstrated to the covered entity in this definition uh, implies, though not specifically, that the recipient should obtain some level of assurance from the staff member that they meet the definition uh, prior to utilizing them as a service. Um, whether that be something as simple as a signed certification stating that they meet the standard or whether the entity engages in some level of competency or fluency testing uh, of bilingual staff members, there should be some documentation that the inquiry was made as to the competency of the staff members' language skills. Um, so here's the definition of qualified translator. When talking about language assistance services, the term interpretation refers to services uh, that occur in the context of oral communications, whereas the term translation refers to language assistance in the context of written communications. As you see, the definition is largely the same uh, for both uh, interpretation, uh, you know, quali uh, qualified interpreter and qualified translator, except that one deals with spoken language and the other deals with written. Um, so the risks of using family members or friends as interpreters. In many circumstances, Family members, friends, and especially children are not competent to provide quality, accurate oral interpretation. For communications of particularly sensitive information, oral interpretation by an individual's family or friend often implicates issues of appropriateness, confidentiality, privacy, and conflict of interest. Uh, friends, and, friends and family may not be proficient in complex terminology, fail to possess the necessary skills and ethical training to interpret, may not be emotionally able to handle sensitive personal information being conveyed, especially in the case of children, uh, or may unintentionally or intentionally 
uh, omit or alter critical information, especially in circumstances uh, involving domestic violence. Uh, so these are all things to be aware of uh, when using family members or friends as interpreters. Um, so uh, thus a covered entity may not rely on family members, friends, or other informal interpreters to provide language assistance services unless there is an imminent threat to the safety or welfare where there is no qualified interpreter immediately available uh, or where the LEP individual specifically requests that an adult family member or companion interpret, that adult, that adult family member agrees and reliance on the family member or companion is appropriate under the circumstances. So that's a three-part test that you know that the you've provided notice of the availability of free language assistance to the LEP individual. They have instead requested an adult family member or uh, uh, an adult family member to interpret instead. You have uh, made a determination that it's, uh, you know, you've made uh, that uh, that family member agrees and you've made a determination that it's appropriate to go forward with the communication using that family member uh, to interpret. However, when LEP individuals elect to use an adult family member or friend as an interpreter, the entity should inform the person that an interpreter can be provided at no cost balance the individual's preference with the need to ensure meaningful access and evaluate if whether because of some special concern like competency, conflict of interest, or confidentiality, a professional interpreter should be provided anyway. In situations where a recipient determines that it is reasonable to honor an individual's request to use a family member or friend as an interpreter, it is a best practice for the recipient to doctor document the individual's declination of free language assistance services in the individual's medical record. A recipient may not rely on a, on a minor child to interpret or facilitate communication, except in an emergency involving an imminent threat to safety uh, to the safety or welfare of an individual or the public, uh, where there is no qualified interpreter for the individual with limited English proficiency immediately available. So again, as this is similar to the last slide, except that this second prong is not present. When you are dealing with a minor child who is a companion of an LEP individual, they can only uh, be used as an interpreter in an emergency involving an imminent, imminent threat to safety or welfare where there is no qualified interpreter immediately available. Um, so uh, video remote interpretation uh, or VRI uh, as it is frequently called uh, is an increasingly method uh, is an increasingly common method that recipients are using to provide LEP individuals with access to qualified interpreters. Um, so video remote interpretation uh, is an interpreting service that uses video tech video conference technology over dedicated lines or wires or a wireless technology offering high speed uh, uh, offering high speed wide bandwidth video connection that delivers high quality video images. So VR, the VRI standards require that video and audio, video and audio that is high quality, clear, real time, and with clear uninterrupted images, dedicated high speed connection, a picture that is clear, sufficiently large and sharply delineated showing, fa delineated, showing face, arms and hand, hands and fingers, uh, Voices that are clear and easily understood and quick setup and training for users. Um, OCR noted in our investigations that we were receiving many complaints about technical issues diminishing the quality of interpretation provided through VRI technology. In response to these concerns, OCR promulgated standards 
for the video for video remote interpretation as part of the 15, 1557 regulation. So uh, timeliness, um, and there isn't much to say about timeliness, uh, except when language assistance is needed, it should be provided at a time and place that avoids the effective denial or delay of services or benefit. Uh, so while timeliness is a requirement of both Title VI and 1557, neither puts specific requirements on the term. Uh, thus, timeliness is a fact-specific inquiry that de depends on the given circumstances of an encounter, um, including uh, which services are being accessed, the condition of the individual, the resources of the recipient, um, and so on, um, would, would determine whether or not, uh, you know, a, a service is timely. <clears throat> um, okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, the administrative requirements uh, of, so both section 1557 and title six also contain specific administrative requirements. Uh, the regulations require that recipients with 15 or more employees designate an employee, designate one employee to, or, you know, a team uh, to coordinate the recipient's language access program. The regulation also requires covered entities with 15 or more employees to establish a grievance policy and procedure through which individuals may submit complaints to the entity if they feel their rights under the regulation have been violated. It is the responsibility of the designated compliance coordinator to investigate and respond to these complaints, including implementing any corrective action. Um, a grievance coordinator under Title VI and Section 1557 may and frequently does serve, serve in the same capacity for a recipient to meet the requirements of other non-discriminations, uh, of other uh, non-discrimination regulations uh, like Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, for example. Uh, so again, uh, having a compliance coordinator is a requirement of, uh, you know, more than just 1557 and Title VI. Uh, there are other regulations that would require that, um, and that person can serve in that role for more than one uh, regulation. Um, notice, notice is another administrative requirement. Recipients with 15 or more employees must also post a notice of non-discrimination in conspicuous physical locations where services are provided. Um, among other information, the notice should include a statement of the individual's right to language assistance and, how, uh, and information about how to access the recipient's language access program. Uh, like the requirement for a grievance policy and procedure and compliance coordinator, um, notices of non-discrimination under Title VI and Section 1557 may be and frequently are combined with other notices of non-discrimination, such as notices required under Title II and uh, Section 504 of the AD and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So here are uh, the required elements of notice. Uh, so notice requires uh, a statement that the recipient does not discriminate on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability in its health programs or activities, that the recipient provides appropriate auxiliary aids and services, uh, that the recipient provides language assistance services, uh, a description of how to obtain auxiliary aids and language assistance services. Uh, if applicable, the name and contact information for the compliance coordinator uh, and the availability of the CE's grievance policy and procedure and how to file a grievance with the entity and also information on how to file a grievance uh, with how to file a discrimination complaint 
uh, with OCR. So it should include both the internal process for resolving grievances um, and also information for contacting us uh, if that ex- internal process is not successful. Eric, you're coming up on your 10 minute. <clears throat> oh, okay, great. So let's talk really quickly about uh, some enforcement examples. Um, Resurrection Healthcare, OCR Region 5, resolved a complaint alleging that Resurrection Healthcare Hospitals, a group of six hospital hospitals totaling over 2,000 beds, had violated Title VI of the Civil Rights Act by failing to provide language assistance services. Uh, To resolve the complaint, OCR agreed to uh, appoint a language access coordinator, train 37 employees as interpreters, uh, contract with an interpreter agency to provide backup services, and establish a comprehensive uh, employee training program on its revised language assistance policies and procedures. Um, In Maryvale Hospital, OCR resolved a complaint alleging that Maryvale Hospital had violated Title VI by failing to provide language assistance services to LEP individuals in its emergency department. In response to OCR's investigation and provision of technical assistance, the hospital took corrective action to improve its language services program, including revising its LEP policy to notify consumers that in-person telephone and video interpretation services are available free of charge, uh, publishing the revised LEP policy on its website and in patient materials, uh, training staff on the revised LEP policy, uh, contracting with a new interpretation service, uh, which provides, uh, which for offering sign language and 60 spoken languages uh, and posting language interpretation information in the main lobby admissions area and emergency department. So again, that notice. Um, finally, uh, me Memorial Hospital. Um, this agreement is the result of three complaints filed in 2012 from LEP patients who speak Triqui Bajo and indigenous Mexican language. Uh, all complaints uh, indicated that they sought healthcare at me Memorial Hospital, but had difficulty communicating and understanding healthcare staff because of insufficient language access services in their primary language. Um, Prior to the completion of OCR's formal investigation, uh, Mew Memorial Hospital and OCR agreed to pursue a voluntary resolution agreement to address the language access concerns raised by the complainants. Um, Under the agreement, Mew Memorial Hospital agreed to revise and implement its language access policies and procedures to ensure oral interpretation and written translation services, uh, to designate a coordinator to ensure language assistance services for LEP individuals, and to appoint a community advisory board uh, that includes members of the local community to address the community's needs and access to qualified interpreters uh, in languages present in the area, um, and to provide notice of, the free lang- uh, notice of free language assistance to persons in languages that they are able to understand. Um, you know, I'm not sure if we have a whole lot of time to go over this, but I'll try to get through this really quick. Uh, yeah, you have quite a few questions on what you've already presented. Then, you know what, I don't, I think we may skip this. Um, this was, I was going, you know, this was to harmonize sort of, uh, we received some complaints of asking questions about, um, you know, this interpreter is present in my healthcare uh, appointment and is able to hear things about me. Is that not a violation of the HIPAA privacy rule? And the section is essentially just, uh, you know, sussing out the ways that it's not a violation of patient privacy for an interpreter to be present in those communications. Um, so that is uh, essentially what that slide covered. So uh, we'll, oh, that's the Cliff's Notes version that it is not a violation of patient privacy. Uh, for language uh, assistance services to be present uh, while they're provided. Um, So with that, I guess uh, we will move on to questions. Okay. 
So um, there was the, the first question was, do the rules uh, you covered apply to specialty care offices that only take private insurance? Um, that only take private insurance. I, so it's hard to say it's hard, uh, you know, um, every there's every, uh, it's, uh, jurisdictional assessments are different for every uh, entity, but I would say that if there's no federal financial assistance, then, uh, we would not have jurisdiction in that situation that our jurisdiction at OCR is over recipients of federal financial assistance. So if there's no, there's no federal funds uh, going into an entity, then it's not likely that we would have jurisdiction over it. Okay. Many places will get an interpreter for, for the provider visit only, but do they have to provide language access for scheduling, billing, and other areas where a client or patient may need to ask questions and get clarification for the service they wish to get or have gotten already? Uh, so vital communications. So the rule would require uh, language access services for any vital communication that's necessary for the individual to receive the services. So for scheduling, yes, I mean, it, I, I would consider that. So that is, a, there's not a bright line rule about that, uh, but it is uh, whether the con communication is considered vital for the person to receive the services. So uh, for in situations like that, uh, where, you know, a, a patient would need to know that the time and place that they're supposed to be, um, I, I, I would consider that, uh, you know, a, a vital communication. But uh, again, it is not, there's no bright line rule and it's, it's a fact specific inquiry. Okay. Um, and so these do these rules also apply to all pharmacies, including translating labels or prescription information into their native language? Um, so there is, uh, so for communications that are small in size, uh, the 1557 regulation, um, I originally, so we're at a kind of an interesting time with 1557 where we're in between two implementation regulations. Um, but, uh, so currently as it stands, uh, for, uh, on prescription bottles, no, there would not need to be um, any, uh, but there are for vital communications such as um, uh, there are taglines. So there is uh, a, it's not the full notice that we talked about, but for smaller communications, there are situations where taglines might be required and taglines are kind of short statements of the availability of language accesses and how to one sentences and how to obtain them. So there are situations in smaller size communications where notice via taglines may be required, but I, I, I can't speak to the exact context or of pharmacies or uh, prescription pill bottles. Okay. Are there directions on how to file a complaint so that we can empower patients or assist in filing complaints? Uh, yes. Uh, so hhs.gov, this website dot, uh, right here, forward slash OCR, uh, will have a complaint portal uh, where complaints can just go in and enter the information about their allegations um, and click send and it, it will come straight to us. So uh, complaints may be submitted just straight through our website. Um, if uh, someone does not, if that's not an accessible format uh, and uh, doing a paper complaint would be more accessible, um, you by all means are able to call or contact us and we will send you a paper complaint form. Okay, thank you. Can you speak to providing language access services for deaf or hard of hearing patients as well as visually impaired or blind patients? Yes, uh, that is actually a, a large area of our jurisdiction as well. Uh, that Those services are provided under Title II or uh, Section 504 of the ADA. So those are different. Uh, oh, and Section 1557, I'm sorry, also includes uh, protections uh, for um, accessibility uh, for persons with disabilities. So that was not really the focus of this presentation, um, but we do uh, enforce regulations that w require accessibility for persons with disabilities, including, uh, including language, language services.
Okay. Um, this next one is actually about six questions, so it's multi-part. Um, we may have to break it down, but I'll read them all, then we can go back. Does the OCR collect data on the occupation of uh, victims, in quotes, for which complaints were filed? If so, what was the number of ag workers served in 2020? Does the OCR only respond to filed complaints from victims, which could be problematic given, given that they are LEPs, or does it reach out to high-risk work settings with large amounts of LEPs to investigate possible violations? How about work settings that are not federally funded? What can OCR do to have a major impact on ag workers? Um, so to answer, I think the first part was, no, it, it's not, uh, it is not a requirement uh, that we accept third party complaints. So it is not necessary for the complainant to be the affected party of the, uh, you know, allegation. Um, and, you know, it, it is not even necessary uh, completely for the uh, third part. So any, so any person has standing to submit a complaint to our office for uh, d any, any conduct of discrimination. They do not have to be the affected party um, in that uh, discriminatory conduct. Uh, you can, we accept complaints from third parties. Um, in terms of reaching out to uh, without a complaint, yes, we do do that as well. Um, we would call that uh, initiating a compliance review. So where we have concerns of uh, about a particular entity, maybe something has come in through the, the news media, or maybe uh, there are a lot of uh, reasons why, but you know, for some reason, we have concerns that a particular entity may not be compliance with one of our regulations. We would uh, initiate what's called a, a compliance review, whereby we uh, start an investigation, basically independent of a complaint. Um, and those are, you know, much more uh, holistic, wide, uh, has had, they have a much wider scope um, frequently than complaint investigations. Um, so, and then I think the third part of the question was about uh, entities that do not receive uh, federal financial assistance and what we can do to help agricultural workers um, and unfortunately, I, uh, you know, we're able to uh, educate um, individuals about their, their rights uh, that we enforce, um, but, uh, you know, we don't have jurisdiction over entities uh, that do not receive federal financial assistance that are, are really are. Uh, so the penalty for not complying with one of our regulations is to have, uh, you know, your the termination of federal financial assistance. So if we don't have that uh, sort of, if we don't have that carrot on the stick, it's, you know, it, it, that that is our jurisdiction in the area is the receipt of federal financial assistance. So it's hard for us to reach ag workers uh, that are not are not working for a federally funded entity. Okay, we have a bunch more questions, but before we get to them, I do need to take a moment to draw everyone's attention to the chat box where I've just posted the evaluation survey for the session. Do please take a moment to complete this evaluation. You can start now and then we'll keep well on with our questions. We do really appreciate your feedback. I also need to thank, again, Community Health Ventures for spon sponsoring this education session. So the next question after uh, the one you just answered is, um, when you're talking about a covered entity, are these federal programs like Medicaid or Medi-Cal? What about other federal agencies like Border Patrol and ICE? So Border Patrol and ICE are not recipients of federal financial assistance because they are, uh, you know, agents of the federal government. However, uh, we all, we have a language access plan at OCR, all federal agencies are required to be in compliance with federal regulations. Uh, so um, they are not an entity that we would initiate an investigation of simply because, you know, they are, they are, they're following the same rules that we are. We have a language access plan that we, uh, you know, comply with, they should too. So that's a, 
So that's how that generally works is that federal agencies don't investigate each other. It's more of a top down thing where if there's something wrong, uh, you know, the uh, it, yeah, it is the government's job to take the steps to uh, rectify that. Okay. Um, the, um, there are a few questions on, uh, actually several questions on um, addressing situations where um, an entity that is covered, so a community migrant health clinic, a hospital with a mutual client, um, other, uh, other entities that the community health water, worker is interfacing with, are not following um, these guidelines, and how would how would you how would they the, the people asking address that situation? So, um, as part of the uh, as part of the fifteen fifty seven and Title VI regulations, they should have information on filing a grievance with that entity available, and that's where I would start. Uh, would be with the grievance procedure. Um, provided, which, you know, the entity is required to provide, um, and with the compliance coordinator that the entity is required to have designated. Um, so that's really where the conversation should start, is by submitting a complaint to the compliance coordinator via the grievance procedure. Um, and if that uh, proves to be unsuccessful, then that entity uh, is also required to provide notice of our contact information and how to file a complaint with OCR. So that would be the next step is if uh, you find uh, you don't find working with directly with that entity successful, then I would move to filing a complaint uh, with our office. And a super sticky question, uh, LEP patients, uh, uh, primarily parents in our area, have a hesitation to complain in any way in fear that specialists in our area will stop accepting Medicaid insurance. Which these are primary optometrists, dentists. What do you recommend when specialists in our area are limited uh, that do accept Medicaid insurance, uh, insured children? Um. What do I, what do I, uh, could you? So the they're afraid to complain because they, they, the, they, they're that, that carrot that and stick you're talking about of accepting Medicaid um, does not seem to be a very strong one. Uh, um, they, they're, they're, they, they may be okay with dropping Medicaid. Um, I, I guess I don't have an easy, easy answer for that question. Um, I would, I would try to work with that entity to, you know, make them understand that this is a population that is present in their service area that is eligible to receive their services and that it was discriminatory for them to uh, not make it accessible. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, I mean, again, if uh, once you, I, I, it's hard for me to say what to do uh, once federal once federal financial assistance isn't present because that really is OCR's jurisdiction uh, over to to make any actions in a, in a situation. Okay, so um, there are there there's there are a couple more uh, questions there, uh, but it also also we're coming up on time, so I wanted to. Um, be sure to let everybody know, to remind everybody again, to fill out that survey. Um, and we are getting a lot of thanks to you, Eric, uh, for the, for the uh, presentation. Thank you so, guys. Thanks. And I wanted to let people know that it's, you know, it's, it's one minute till, so it's okay if you start dropping off, but I'm going to give you one more question. Um, uh, Eric, uh, as a community health worker, I noticed that these rules are not being followed by entities covered. What is OCR doing to update entities on these regulations and what can be done at a state level to enforce these regis uh, regulations? Um, well, pr conferences like this is our public education campaign is part of what we do to make uh, make the public, uh, meaning both the, the protected classes and also the regulated community aware of what uh, the regulations are. Um, we, when we take any enforcement action, we release uh, press releases about them so that people in the industry are able to see 
you know, here's what the rules are. Here's a situation where they got violated and what happened. Um, so, yeah, those are in terms of public outreach, I would say uh, are publicizing our enforcement activities and uh, engaging in these outreach activities like uh, the one we're having right now are really our main methods of sort of getting the message out there of uh, what what the requirements for language access are. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of the presentation and uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. And everyone for attending.